get to it. Uh, okay, I, so this is just an outline of the talk. I will review time and band limiting on the real line and how uh, prolate functions, prolate spheroidal wave functions are computed for certain uh, parameters. Uh, then I will uh, talk about the, the case of Euclidean spaces. And then at the end, I will talk about some um, analogs for bandpass case. So the theory uh, starts going on 150 years ago. My understanding is that uh, Charles Niven um, introduced the prolate functions in studying um, heat conduction for, for ellipsoids. And in this case, in his case, it was uh, it was prolates, so the the rotation of an ellipse around its major axis. But he also remarked in the paper that, uh, and the same method works for planetary ellipsoids. So that's the beginning. Uh, after separation of variables in in uh, what can call uh, prolate coordinates, one one gets a one dimensional uh, differential operator that I'll call P sub C, D by DT, one minus T squared D by DT. And I am putting a factor four pi squared um, in front because I went to the Benedetto school and uh, was told to always incorporate two pi in the Fourier transform. So it's there. And the eigenfunctions of this operator are the prolate spheroid wave functions for the, uh, sometimes it's called the bandwidth parameter C. And that's a picture for C equals five of the first four. And when I say first, the I, I'll call those the most concentrated ones and and uh, and mention what that has to do with concentration eventually. Okay, so skipping ahead uh, several years to the early 1960s, uh, before uh, Pollock and Slepian were attorneys at law, a different uh, Slepian and Pollock were mathematicians working at Bell Labs, and they made this connection uh, bet be between the prolate functions and the problem in communications, which is which is concentration of signals on a time interval within uh, a certain bandwidth. So the differential operator commutes with uh, with this composition of projection operators. So Q I'm using to denote uh, multiplication by the characteristic function of the interval minus one, one on the real line. And P sub C I'm using to denote the band limiting operator. So the Fourier transform um, truncation to minus C to C and then inverse Fourier transform. And the prolate functions are eigenfunctions of uh, P sub CQ for the bandwidth parameter C. And there are also eigenfunctions for this dilated Fourier transform integration from minus one to one against the uh, kernel E to the two pi I C T S. So the dilation is by is putting the, the factor C in the exponent. So it's it's not going to go through a proof of that, but if you look at the operator, and if you recall that differentiation uh, is intertwined uh, with multiplication by the variable uh, for the Fourier transform, then if you if you do all that intertwining and rearrange things, then you get an operator that looks the same except with different factors out in front. And that's basically the, the reason why uh, the prolate differential operator uh, commutes with uh, both band limiting and truncation in time and with the truncated Fourier transform. Okay, so so Landau, Slepian, and Pollock made this connection with time and band limiting. Uh, they observed that the prolate differentiation operator uh, commutes with the operator P sub CQ. And in the first paper uh, by Slepian and Pollock, it was observed that the, uh, the, the eigenvalues of P sub CQ are energy concentrations, uh, that the, the eigenfunctions of P sub CQ, the prolates, form an orthonormal basis for the Paley-Wiener space, 
um, and that their truncations, when suitably normalized by the eigenvalues, also form an orthonormal basis of, for L2 of minus 1, 1. So they're complete in L2 of minus 1, those truncations. Uh, they didn't observe this in the first paper, but it's a consequence uh, that has come to be known as the spectral accumulation property, which is that if you sum all of the uh, squares of the Fourier transforms of the prolates and weight them by the eigenvalues, then on the, the support interval in the, in the spectrum, uh, they add up to a constant. This property is critical for uh, Thompson's multi-taper method, which has a variety of spectrum estimation applications ranging from geophysics uh, and astrophysics to communications as well. And uh, Thompson's paper has been cited in all these different areas. Thompson's 1982 paper. Okay. And then there is, uh, there were various versions of what's come to be known as the two omega T theorem, which uh, addresses the number of eigenvalues of time and band limiting that are close to one. And this form is Landau and Wudome in, in 1980. And it says the number of eigenvalues of, of P omega QT. So QT is uh, truncation to the interval minus T to T. Uh, the number of eigenvalues larger than some number alpha between zero and one is the time bandwidth product to omega t plus this product of logarithmic terms that uh, includes the factor alpha and uh, omega t and then a little o of log omega t. If you take alpha equals one half, then that log term one minus alpha over alpha, that's log of one, so that term goes away. And actually the red term is uh, is big O of one, it's actually just uh, a fixed a fixed bounded number, right? All right, so that says the number of eigenvalues of time and band limiting close to one is approximately equal to the time bandwidth product. And here are some pictures for various values of the time bandwidth product uh, equal to 10, 20, and 50. And in each case, you can see that uh, the curve, the eigenvalue curve crosses over one half uh, approximately exactly at the, at the time bandwidth product. Okay, so that's the, that's the, uh, the connection with time and band limiting. Uh, the Bell Labs, the, the basic components of the Bell Labs theory of the 1960s. So I wanna come back to actually how one computes the prolates. So this is a this is a paper by C.J. Bocamp, uh, a little bit after World War II, and that's a picture of of Bocamp on top and on the bottom of an American mathematician named Gertrude Blanche. And in the in the third paragraph, I'm just going to read this. We would like to draw attention to the fact, however, that in our thesis, exactly the same method as described by Miss Blanche was developed for spheroidal wave functions, and this is the method to compute their values. As is emphasized by Ms. Blanche, the method in question is actually applicable to all types of equations. Whenever the coefficients occurring in the development of the characteristic function are determined by a three-term recursion form. So uh, the method uh, it has come to be known as Bocamp's method, and the, the critical uh, point is this recursion for coefficients of the expansions of eigenfunctions. So I'm going to go into a little bit more detail here. And so uh, after about 2000, a refinement, maybe refinement isn't isn't exactly the right word, but a, a different perspective on Bocamp's method uh, was discovered independently by Zhao, Yarvin, and Rockland. So Zhao, this is in Hong Zhao's thesis, and uh, John Boyd a little few years later. And so it starts with the prolate differential equation and observes that the first term, the d by dt, one minus t squared d by dt, that is uh, the differential operator whose eigenfunctions are the Legendre polynomials on the real line. And the, then you just have this multiplication by a constant times multiplication by t squared. 
And that term is amenable to what's known as the Bonnet formula or Bonnet formula for Legendre polynomials. I'll, I'll write down on the next slide. And the critical observation by Zhao et al. and Boyd is that if you just want to compute the eigenfunctions up to some order, then you can use this three-term recursion, to build a matrix and truncate the matrix up to some not some size, depending on the order of the eigenfunctions you want to compute. And that truncation gives you a good estimation of the of the coefficients of the expansions. Uh, themselves. So here are the some of the gory details. So those that's the eigenvalue of the Legendre polynomials P sub n. Uh, that's the second line is the Bonnet formula uh, expressing uh, multiplication of the nth Legendre polynomial by x in terms of the previous, the n minus first Legendre polynomial and the next n plus first Legendre polynomial. So if you multiply by x squared, then uh, p sub n is, is also expressed in terms of the n minus second and the n plus second Legendre polynomial. If I put a bar over le the Legendre polynomials, it just means I'm normalizing them for L2 of minus one, one. So here I'm taking an eigenfunction of the prolate differential operator phi, I'm expanding it in normalized Legendre polynomials and the beta L's are the coefficients. And then if one, uh, if it's an eigenfunction, then applying the prolate differential operator or minus the prolate differential operator, on the one hand, it's multiplying by the characteristic value denoted chi sub n. And on the other hand, it's applying the differential operator, the two components, the, the component uh, of which the, uh, Legendre polynomials are eigenfunctions, and then the component that has a multiplication by x squared. So the multiplication by x squared, uh, you you apply the Bonnet formula, and you you end up with these gory terms, uh, which give rise to the three-term recursion for the coefficients beta uh, sub L of the expansion of the prolates. Okay, so that three-term recursion can be codified in terms of a matrix. And those are the entries of a matrix. It's a symmetric uh, tridiagonal matrix. So the first row there are the entries uh, that looks like they're the entries uh, below the diagonal. The, then the, the second row are the entries on the diagonal. The third row are the entries above the diagonal. Okay, so, so, so Zhao et al, what they they did was they they went through some some estimates to justify truncating that matrix if one is interested in computing the first several prolates, and then Boyd he didn't he didn't go through the same estimates but he he basically gave some justifications of why one can use a truncation. So if you want to compute the first n prolates. You can truncate the matrix to size approximately 2n plus 30 um, without really justifying the 30, but uh, but giving giving concrete estimates for the errors uh, that arise that way. So it works well for estimating the first several prolate functions. And then eigen eigenvalues are, are a different matter, uh, but there's been work also more recent. Uh, for getting good approximations of the eigenvalues. Okay, so this can be considered a variation of uh, of Bocamp's method, and, and which allows for a truncation. Um, you decide how many prolate functions you want to compute, and then you you just take a make the matrix uh, that describes the recursion, and you truncate it once and for all, and then you then you give some estimates to tell you what the error actually looks like for that truncation. All right, now, so that's part one. Part two is switching to, uh, to higher dimensions, so RM. So this is the first page of Slepian's paper, 1964, uh, in which Slepian uh, worked out aspects of the theory of time and of, of, well, spatial spectral limiting in RM. 
And so that bottom line introduces an operator uh, whose eigenfunctions are the radial parts of the of the solutions to the time and band limiting problem, the eigenfunctions of the time and band limiting operator. And it looks just like uh, the prolate differential operator, except there's a last term on the right, which is a one fourth minus n squared, n is not actually an integer here, uh, divided by the, the 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 radial variable x squared in this case. And he refers to uh, eigenfunctions of this operator as general, uh, generalized prolate spheroidal wave functions. And so the, these 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 eigenfunctions are described the radial parts, and then depending on n, they're coupled with spherical harmonics of appropriate order uh, to to obtain the the um, the generalized prolate spheroidal wave functions in higher dimensions. Uh, what he actually does is he he works this out in two dimensions uh, for functions that are band limited to a disk. And then he does a change of variables trick uh, to to get the the prolates in higher dimensions by by doing a change of variables trick and then and then associating these radial parts with appropriate order um, spherical harmonics. Okay, so so that's uh, Slepian worked that out. Uh, you know, while the that was that's one of the Bell Labs papers. Uh, there's more recent work by a group at Yale. I believe one of the uh, one of the persons involved in that is in the audience here. I'm not going to go into details there. Um, Slepian did point point out this connection with Zernica polynomials in his 1964 paper, and uh, the the work by the Yale group uh, sort of develops the one dimensional theory that I just outlined. Um, it codifies that, it, but it but it 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 codifies it in a way that is is fundamentally second order, treating the operator fundamentally, the operators, the generalized uh, prolate operators, uh, as second order operators, and and so a couple of years after that, uh, Hamed Bagal Ghaffari, who was a student of Jeff Hogan's, at that time. Uh, and introduce Clifford algebras into this, and to bring it back down to uh, making the sort of the the connection with the original prolate differential operator. And so I'll, I'm going to write that down. But first, a, a very 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 quick review of Clifford algebras. So Clifford algebra of of Euclidean space basically embeds uh, Euclidean space R with an upper M into a two to the m dimensional algebra by introducing a basis of products of the, the basis vectors in Euclidean space, uh, which is basically e i e j uh, is minus e j e i. So it's non-commutative. And e i times e i is a scalar, the scalar minus one. And so we can define Clifford conjugation uh, just by putting a bar over the the, the Euclidean uh, basis elements and uh, saying that 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 those are the those are the square roots of minus one, basically. All right. The main the main uh, the the key tool for us in what follows is is the simple fact that if you take a vector in Euclidean space and embed it into the algebra, then you multiply it by itself, you square it, and you get a scalar. You get a, the, you get a real scalar, which is minus the Euclidean modulus of x squared. And as a result of that, you can define the exponential of uh, tx, where t is a real number and x is a vector, and that turns out simply to be, that's a vector, and uh, its real part is cosine of T modulus X, 
And the vector part is x over modulus x sine of t modulus x. Then one also has this differential operator, which you can think of as the gradient operator embedded into the uh, operator algebra. So, so basically, ej d by dxj summed from 1 to m. It's called the Dirac operator. And it's a square root of minus the Laplace as an operator. OK, there are some things you have to be careful about because of non-commutativity. Uh, if you take Clifford algebra of valued functions, you can define an inner product. But the inner product is not a scalar. It is a, it's a Clifford number. It's an element of the Clifford algebra. But you can take its scalar part. And if you take a Clifford algebra valued function and you do this conjugation of the Clifford algebra valued function and you integrate that times itself, you get uh, the norm squared, which is the scalar part of the inner product of a Clifford algebra valued function f with itself. Okay, that's about all of the Clifford algebra that we need for for what comes next. I'm not without going into the details. So, so how might I assist? Thesis, he 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 wrote down the analog of the one-dimensional um, prolate differential operator. So that simply replaces d by dt by the Dirac operator, partial x. And uh, there, okay, there's a change from a plus sign to a minus sign somewhere that has to do with the fact that the vector x squared is equal to minus its modulus squared. But the, but you get an operator um, on on Clifford algebra valued functions that looks like the prolate differential operator, and then everything goes through. So that differential operator commutes with uh, the truncated Fourier transform. And when I say the Fourier transform, I don't mean a, a there are fancy Clifford <coughs> algebra Fourier transforms, but we're we're really dealing with the the standard Euclidean. Fourier transform, but we're integrating Clifford valued functions. So the so the exponential has an you're evaluating it on on vectors in Rm. Okay. And you're taking the the scalar inner product, e to the two pi ic scalar inner product xy, but then f of y is a Clifford algebra valued function, right? And then multiplying by the and so you get the you get these analogs of the of the uh, truncated Fourier transform and you get these analogs of the uh, time and band limiting operators in higher dimensions and those operators commute with this thing that I'm calling the Perlet differential operator so that is a theorem and and Hamid's dissertation that uh, that 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 higher dimensional prolate differential operator that acts on Clifford algebra valued functions commute, uh, commutes with the spatiospectral limiting operator. Okay. And so eigenfunctions of the spatiospectral limiting operator will refer to as CPSWFs or Clifford prolate spheroidal wave functions. So the so what I'm going to tell you and then go very quickly through the slides is that the one dimensional theory where you uh, you define Legendre polynomials and then multiplication by X and then you put those together and you get the differential operator that acts on the prolate functions. There's a, the, the, the theory goes through, except one has to be a little bit careful about uh, we're, what functions you're applying this to? Uh, what are the analogs of the Legendre polynomials? And so I'm going to define these spaces x sub k, and what they are essentially is c infinity real valued functions times these functions y sub k, which is the usual notation for spherical harmonics, except we're not going to use spherical harmonics. Uh, we're going to use something called spherical monogenics. So what's the spherical monogenic? You can think of uh, a spherical monogenic as a Clifford algebra valued 
function that's like the spherical harmonic. And you can literally, uh, examples of them consist of applying the Dirac operator to, spher to actual spherical harmonics. So that's probably the best way to think about them is you're just, you're taking a spherical harmonic and applying uh, the Dirac operator. And that gives you a spherical monogenic. Okay. Uh, if you if you if you restrict the homogeneity of the spherical harmonic to be homogeneous of degree k, I'm going to call those m sub k spherical harmonics homogeneous of degree k. Those are hom homogeneous uh, Clifford algebra polynomials. The space for a fixed value of k has dimension m plus k minus two choose k. Uh, we're mostly interested in three dimensions, so. In three dimensions, that's just k plus one choose k, so just k plus one. So you can think of that dimension as being k plus one. And so these you can define Clifford Legendre polynomials as analogs of Legendre polynomials, where instead of taking um, d by dt and hitting one but one minus x squared with d by dt d by dx and times you're taking one minus modulus of x squared, vector x squared, and hitting it with the Dirac operator after you multiply by one of these spherical monogenics. And because these are these spherical monogenics, that what does a spherical monogenic mean um, in the algebra? It means that they're in the kernel of the Dirac operator. So when you apply the Leibniz formula uh, for the Dirac operator that kills uh, that kills the the spherical monogenic part. So you end up with just a polynomial times the spherical monogenic after you apply the Dirac operator n times. Okay, so you get these Gori Rodriguez formulas that are I have in small font there. And then if I put a bar over these things, I'm calling Clifford Legendre polynomials. That just means I'm normalizing them uh, to have L2 norm one with respect to the the, the volume measure in the unit ball in RM. So that's what a uh, bar over the Legendre, the, the Clifford Legendre polynomials. Okay, uh, there are formulas for the Fourier transforms of these. They're simply um, Bessel functions with the power of the Fourier variable in the denominator. Uh, and we use this nice property of spherical harmonics, which also goes over to the spherical monogenics, which is that you can pass them through the Fourier transform. And then there's a Bonnet formula, recurrence formula, uh, which means that if you multiply a Clifford Legendre polynomial by the vector x, and the multiplication is in the Clifford algebra, then you can write that as a sum of the previous and next. Um, Clifford Legendre polynomials. And those are just, uh, that's just what you need to, to do the, the theory, uh, the one, the theory for computing, for expanding, uh, Clifford Perlase for all wave functions in terms of, uh, the Clifford Legendre polynomials. And you get a matrix that's, that's almost just like the one dimensional case, except you have to account for this factor k, which is the homogeneity of the spherical monogenic. So I'm writing this term nu, which is k, the homogeneity of the spherical monogenic, plus half the dimension. Um, I, the, I'm always taking the dimension to be odd unless I say otherwise. And so to get the coefficients of the expansion of the Clifford prolates, uh, I just you, you can you can just uh, take the eigenvectors, the discrete eigenvectors of this matrix. This is for the what I'm going to call the even order um, prolates, even though when I graph them, they don't look necessarily look like they're even. And uh, there's a similar matrix for what I'll call the odd order, but it's completely analogous to the one dimensional theory that was worked out by Zhao et al. and by um, by Boyd about 20 years ago. Okay, so that so 
the Clifford algebra, as I said before, the Yale group worked out worked worked this out, and the and the matrix the matrices look essentially the same, but they're they they used uh, some other methods. Um, but if you embed RM in the Clifford algebra, then I would I would argue, although the algebra looks maybe a little bit scarier, it's actually slightly more elegant, and uh, and and you can you can end up claiming that the that that the method for producing the Clifford prolates for wave functions is uh, completely analogous to the one dimensional theory. Okay. All right, and so if we write the eigenfunctions this way, so either an even polynomial times a spherical monogenic or an odd polynomial times a spherical monogenic, then one can also, uh, sorry, these are what the even uh, terms or odd terms look like if one graphs them for various, uh, I'm, I'm fixing the value of the bandwidth parameter as C equals five, and I'm taking uh, various, uh, orders of the homogeneity of the spherical monogenics. And these are the radial parts of the Clifford prolate spheroidal wave functions that are being plotted here for those values. Uh, this says that we can compute the eigenvalues of the, uh, of what? Of the truncated Fourier transform. That's what those mu terms look like. And in the bottom in the box, there's a relationship between the eigenvalues of the truncated Fourier transform and the lambdas, which are the eigenvalues of the spatio-spectral limiting operator. I'm not going to go through the details, but um, but one can compute those accurately um, just from knowing the coefficients of the just from knowing the the discrete eigenvectors of those matrices that I wrote in the previous slide. Now, somebody probably has worked this out. Um, I'm writing it as a conjecture because I haven't seen it written out somewhere, but I'm surprised if it hasn't been. But uh, the conjecture I'm writing down is that counting dimensional multiplicities, the number of eigenvalues of the spatio-spectral limiting operator larger than one half is approximately uh, the bandwidth parameter to the power of the dimension times the square of the volume of the unit ball in RM. Okay, uh, there's a little bit of heuristic there, but I am I have too many slides, so I'm going to skip through that. And um, like I said, I'm afraid that somebody's worked this out and just hasn't made it public. So, um, but please let me know so that I can devote my energies elsewhere if you if if you're aware of a proof of this uh this is these these are uh eigenvalues for uh different values of the the uh homogeneity of the spherical monogenic part so what you can see is that when you increase the order of the spherical monogenic the number of eigenvalues close to one decreases i haven't included the multiplicities so if i then do include the multiplicities and write the uh all of the eigenvalues of the spatial spectral limiting operator for a fixed value of the bandwidth parameter, the curves look like this. So when the bandwidth parameter C is equal to five, that's the purple curve on the left. If C equals six, that's the yellow curve and so on. You can see, um, one thing you can see at least is that uh, the plunge region, which is the where the eigenvalues uh, change from being close to one to being close to zero, is more spread out. This is a, this is in three dimensions, uh, so it's not simply a logarithm of the of the of the of the bandwidth parameter. It's it's there's going to be a dimensional factor in there as well. Okay, the, and then this uh, is a representation of uh, another theorem in Ahmed's thesis, which is. He worked out the uh, spectral accumulation for uh, for spatial spectral limiting in higher dimensions. So it's the same sum of the the squares of the Fourier transforms of the Clifford prolate spheroidal wave functions weighted by the eigenvalues of spatial spectral limiting. 
And if you take partial sums up to some order of homogeneity, but for a fixed bandwidth parameter. So here I've got a fixed bandwidth parameter C equals five. I've fixed the dimension M equals three, and I'm summing over the homogeneity terms. So the blue curve I'm summing over uh, the, the homogeneity K equals one to five, zero to five really. Uh, the red curve is K equals one to 10. The yellow curve is up to 20. And uh, the purple curve is all the way up to 40. It looks like uh, it's basically flat. So if you've accounted for all the homogeneity, all the eigenvalues that are that are larger than one half, uh, that's what that top curve does. And you essentially get this ideal bandpass filter by summing the weighted squares of all the of the prolates in higher dimensions. Okay. Now. Hopefully somebody can put this to use and use this if there are filtering problems in higher dimensions that are of interest, um, then an analog of Thompson's multi-taper method uh, could be applied. It's It might be heavy on the computational side, but on the other hand, it, it might be it might be of use. So, uh, so there's that, spectral accumulation. Okay, so that's part two. Part three, is bandpass analogs. And I want, I just, I'm going to go through this a little bit quickly, I'm afraid, but in part two, Clifford algebra was a, uh, a tool of convenience, but not necessarily a tool of necessity. And I'm going to argue that if one is interested in uh, doing a bandpass version of prolates, then, then uh, Clifford algebra becomes a tool of necessity in higher dimensions. So, so going on 10 years ago now, uh, Jeff Hogan and I worked out a bandpass version of the prolate functions themselves in one dimension. And the idea was you use baseband prolates. Uh, so you have an interval centered at the origin in spectrum. Uh, you shift it to the right by a fixed amount. Now you've got an interval in the positive frequency domain. You shift it to the left by the same amount, you've got an interval in the negative frequency domain. And you've got uh you've got eigenfunctions for for band limiting onto those intervals in the positive and negative frequency domain. And if you want eigenfunctions for band pass limiting, limiting to the to that pass band, you can express uh, those eigenfunctions in terms of the the shifted eigenfunctions shift in the shifting to the left and to the right in the in the spectral domain. But you've got to account now for the fact that uh, that when you time limit those those shifts to the left and the right are no longer orthogonal to each other. And so you get these integrals in that formula at the bottom line uh, that that uh, correspond to the the integrals, of the truncations uh, to the to the concentration interval, the inner products of the restrictions to the concentration interval of those uh, of those prolates that are shifted uh, to the left or to the right in the frequency domain. Those are entries of a matrix that we build where the diagonal elements are the eigenvalues of uh, of time and band limiting for the baseband. And then we get these overlap factors, um, these gamma matrices that account for the the fact that uh, that when you shift in frequency and truncate to the time interval, you, they're no longer orthogonal to each other. However, you can make this matrix; it's a discrete matrix, and you can compute its eigenvectors, but they're infinite dimensional. Uh, but those eigenvectors. Uh, are the are the eigenvectors when you expand uh, what we call bandpass prolates in terms of the 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 modulated baseband prolates? So that's this uh, formula in the third line of the text. That's where those coefficients are coming from. And the I should have written mu there instead of lambda maybe, but the but the corresponding eigenvalues of this big square matrix are the 
are the eigenvalues of, of what we will call time and bandpass limit. We were interested, there are some examples for, for um, we're shifting far out to the left and the right in the, in the spectrum to get these. Uh, but, and then the baseband uh, has width 2.5 units. We were interested in some applications, um, potential applications. We're interested in frames. Um, we're interested in, in wavelet frames. So we, we were going to use these bandpass prolates. Uh, we're thinking of them as wavelets, but, but not just one generator having multi-wavelets where we use several of them. Enough of them to get something that looks like an ideal bandpass filter when we sum their squares. So there is an analog of the spectral accumulation property for the bandpass case. And that's this proposition that I've hit, written down here where I, the psi sub ends are these, these things I'll call bandpass prolates. They're, they're frequency supported in a pass band, uh, but they're time concentrated in a time interval. And when we sum their squares weighted against uh, eigenvalues of time and bandpass limiting, they add up to a constant. So, so this spectral accumulation property is not is not restricted to uh, to to bandpass uh, to to sorry to baseband limiting. Uh, it's actually a more general phenomenon, and we've we've got a SAMPTA paper where we've got uh, more general conditions on the spectral support that allows for some spectral accumulation property uh, to occur. All right, uh, the, it's easy to write the proof of the spectral accumulation property down if you're comfortable um, interchanging orders of uh, integration. So there's a simple proof to that. And when you take partial sums of the squares of the baseband prolates, you get something that looks like the red curve. Uh, as I said, we were interested in applications to uh, to multi wavelets. So these are some some multi wavelet frame generators uh, that one gets uh, from using these this time these time and bandpass limiting eigenfunctions. And what we were really interested in is a, a way of taking a complicated signal, one dimensional signal though, and associating. Um, associating a part of that signal that lives in a specific frequency band, but as is centered around a specific point in time. And that's what we have here. The top uh, figure shows a, a uh, that's an EEG channel signal. And then we've extracted um, a high pass component uh, living close to a, a specific instant in time, and that's the that's the lower frequency. So we so that's what we were interested in at the time uh, as a potential application of of uh, time and bandpass limiting operators. Okay, now in higher dimensions, the thing is you can't just take you can't you can't get a basis for functions that are bandpass limited to an annulus simply by taking functions that are bandpass limited uh, to a ball centered at the origin and shifting them around. It doesn't work. You don't, you can't cover, you can't get a unique covering uh, without overlap like you can in the case of one dimension. So you need something more sophisticated. So what we what we introduced with Jeff was um, a Clifford version of modulation where we take uh, it's just it just looks the same as modulation in the one in the in the case of the real line, but x now is a vector in Rm. We're multiplying it by a number and we're taking the exponential e to the two pi t x, and we're calling that Clifford modulation. Multiplying a Clifford valued function by that thing is called Clifford modulation. And if we if we take Clifford modulation, apply it to a function, and then we take the Fourier transform, then we get something called uh, Clifford translation times the function of the that we started with. 
So that that box Clifford translation means we're we're conjugating Clifford modulation with the Fourier transform, and I'm getting an operator that I'm denoting e to the it, and that's the Dirac operator. Uh, there's a connection between Clifford translation and solutions of the wave equation that allow one to conclude that if one starts with a function supported in the unit uh, frequency supported in the unit ball in RM, and this is in an odd dimension, then if you apply Clifford translation, uh, then that function Fourier transform is supported in an annulus. Okay, so. So working in the Clifford setting allows you to do this. It allows you to apply a translation operator that takes a function that's supported in a ball and gets you a function as a result that is supported in an annulus. Okay. And, and once we have that, we can we can do in higher dimensions, we can do an analog of, of uh spatio. Uh, bandpass spectral limiting. Okay, I'm not going to write down the gory details because I'm out of time. Uh, but there is a caveat here, which me, which is that there is a. Uh, you start with the basis for L2 of the unit ball, which consists of these uh, Clifford Legendre polynomials, for example. And if you Clifford translate them, you end up with functions that are orthogonal in the in L2 of the annulus, but they're not complete anymore. Uh, there's a finite dimensional uh, orthogonal subspace. So one has to account for that. Uh, but you can do that. They're polynomials. You can you can write them down. Um, and then you can do the same game that it, we did in one dimension, which is you build this discrete matrix. You compute the eigenvectors of this matrix, and they become the coefficients of, of spatial bandpass spectral limiting and the radial parts look like that. Okay, so we're there now. Uh, my interest in this is potential applications uh, to communications. 5G, apparently they're using beam forming, which means that you have to be able to transmit a signal in space within a narrow angle. But also you want that signal to be uh, spectrum limiting, limited to a, a, a specific part of the spectrum. Uh, these functions won't do that, but they give us the start. They give us, um, Simone's did something uh, uh, analogous where he's working specifically on the sphere. So we're trying to build uh, sort of hybrid uh, spatial spectral limited functions where the concentration is on an angle in the spherical, a spherical cap. And then uh, the spectral concentration is on to a specific frequency band. So they they're not this this type of signal, but these are the kind of techniques that are going to be used to build these. Um, and I'm working with that uh, with Jeff on that now. I just I, I want to finish with one very important slide. Um, this is a picture of John Gilbert, who mentored me early in my career after John. Benedetto uh, decided it was safe to unleash me on the, the rest of the world. Um, I'm not sure that John was really convinced it was safe to do that, but he did it anyway. And uh, and then um, John Gilbert was kind enough to take me in during those formative years. Uh, this was after he wrote a book on Clifford algebras with uh, Margaret Murray. And uh, so John, uh, what little I do know about Clifford algebras, I learned from from John Gilbert. Uh, John passed away a little bit over a year ago. And uh, so I just wanted to dedicate this talk to his memory. And I'll stop there. Thank you all for being a kind audience.